Okay. Again? We're good. Oh, heck yeah. Sweet. We're good there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm glad so many people made it. Uh, this week, Aaron McCanty will be teaching us about vulnerability research and reverse engineering. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I said, my name is Aaron McCanty. My contact information is up there. I work at uh, Battelle Memorial Institute. I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. I'm going to talk about reverse engineering and automated vulnerability analysis. Um, so uh, a little bit of gender, we're going to talk about why we do this kind of stuff, why cyber exists. Uh, we're going to talk about reverse engineering and discovering vulnerabilities, how reverse engineering could be used to discover vulnerabilities, how we're automating vulnerability discovery, um, and then some of the tools that we use to automate vulnerability discovery. Who am I? Uh, Aaron McCanty. I uh, went to school at Ohio State. I'm a cybersecurity researcher at Battelle up in uh, Columbus. Battelle is a nonprofit research and development company. We've about 20,000 employees worldwide. We're actually the world's largest nonprofit research and development company, um, headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, my work is focused primarily on embedded system reverse engineering and vulnerability research. So I just take embedded systems and break them all day, which nice. is a lot of fun. Um, so it's a nice mix of hardware, software, firmware, everything in between. Um, one of the big uh, key things that I uh, research at, at Patel is how to uh, automate cyber workflows. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what that means in just a minute, but a little bit more uh, about Patel. Um, $6 billion a year global research development enterprise located in Columbus. We're a nonprofit. Um, we're actually uh, started by a charitable trust uh, left from our, our founder, Gordon Patel, when he died. Um, 20,000 employees in over 100 locations, blah, 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 doing all kinds of really cool research in national security, cyber, chemical and biological defense, critical infrastructure, uh, medical industries, all that stuff. Um, the cool thing about being a nonprofit is that um, our, uh, pro our, our profit is reinvested into one, our employees, and two, our, our community. Um, so we get to do a lot of really awesome things. We get to support our community uh, a lot. That's why I'm down here. Um, part of the big emphasis we have is on community outreach and bringing other people up along with the research that we do. Um, our mission statement is actually translate scientific discovery into societal benefits, which is a really cool mission statement. Um, something that's really awesome to work for. Uh, we also are responsible for many of the familiar technologies and products that you know about today. Um, so we were founded in 1929, we've been around for a long time. Uh, some of the uh, most th famous things that have come out of Battel, uh, we actually helped create CDs, uh, Xerox machine, um, cruise control, uh, and actually, the, the one that I found out about recently is the little dimples in golf balls was a Battelle invention. Um, so you're welcome. Um, if, if that's not, you know, critical to national security, I don't know what is. But all right, so more on to cybersecurity. So cybersecurity really matters. Um, everything from your car to your baby monitor touched the internet. Now a lot of these things were designed in a time. Uh, where the internet didn't really exist, so a lot of the networks on vehicles in particular um, are not secured at all because the people that designed them never intended for cars to touch the internet, but now they are. Um, it's kind of scary because there's a lot of bad people on the internet. Um, you guys might be some of them. Um, <laughs> on top of that, smart homes are on the rise. I know everyone has the smart speaker in their home. Everyone has smart uh, light switches, light bulbs, everything in the house. Um, that's just another thing that uh, people can use to uh, do malicious things with. Our lives are being stored in the cloud every, every other day that we see a data breach where your credit card information is leaked online. And, um, even the office personnel management uh, was hacked and everyone that has a clearance had all their information taken a couple years ago, uh, which was great. Now China knows everyone that has a clearance. Um, Software and hardware supply chains are also moving overseas. So basically every device, every embedded system, or every microcontroller that's in your computers and smartphones is made in China. And China is hostile to the United States. Um, so if you don't see a problem with that, then, well, I don't know why you're here. But um, what if there is hidden functionality in that processor in the phone? Uh, what if there's something that um, the manufacturers in China baked in to get around and, and siphon off data without you knowing? Um, how do we verify that? Um, on top of that, wars are quickly moving to a different kind of battlefield. You'll actually hear um, people in the military now talk about the five domains of warfare, uh, that being land, sea, air, space, and cyber. Um, so they actually view it as a battlefield now. Um, and uh, a lot of the things that are happening in the world today are actually state-sponsored actions that are intended to cripple cyber infrastructure. Um, it's actually really kind of scary, uh, but that's why it's, why it's important. So to drive this point home, I'm going to talk about um, Microtik is a Latvian-based embedded system manufacturer. Um, they're actually supposedly known for their quality design and high security. Um, they make routers and uh, network devices, that, that kind of stuff. Um, as pretty much everyone's aware, high security doesn't really mean anything. Um, uh, 
They are also, uh, funny enough, provided by most Brazilian ISPs to their customers. So when people buy internet in uh, Brazil, most of their ISPs give them a microchip router. Um, last year, several, or a couple years ago, several vulnerabilities were disclosed and released, um, which led to this as a big uh, headline. Uh, there was a massive crypto jacking campaign that, that uh, touched over 200,000 microchip routers. I talked about this a lot the last time that I was down here, about how crypto jacking works and, and, and how people go about doing that. Um, so uh, the, the factors here that led to this were the fact that a lot of people in one geographic location had the exact same uh, device that they were using that made a very juicy target, um, especially with a ISP provided um, device. Most people aren't gonna update their, their own router. Uh, if you ask your parents to update their router, they're probably gonna look at you blankly and ask what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> um, so, um, Otherwise, in the news, we've also seen this. That This was last year. Um, Bloomberg released a report about how China used a tiny chip to infiltrate the US companies. Basically, they had a report that um, uh, a small, uh, basically, the motherboards that Chinese companies were creating were not built entirely to spec, and they had additional capabilities built onto them. Um, there was some question on whether this was real or not. Um, I don't think it's ever been verified one way or the other whether it actually happened or not, but the point is that it could happen very easily. Um, uh, Amazon is not going to take every device that they order from China out of the box and inspect it um, at the uh, you know integrated circuit level. Um, that's just not going to happen. So this kind of thing could definitely happen in today's society. So uh, reverse engineering. Um, the goal is to learn how something works: software, hardware, and everything in between. So these these concepts you, you're given a system or a um, a device or something like that. You, you want to figure out how it works, why it's doing what it, or how it's doing what it's doing, uh, and how you can um, mess with it. Uh, those are kind of the goals of reverse engineering. Um, oftentimes, security researchers don't get source code, so we have to be a little bit more creative with how we take apart systems. Um, but there is a lot of uh, juicy information crammed into a compiled binary. Even if it you know doesn't look like uh, human readable text, we can very easily translate it to something that is more human readable. Um, uh, researchers often have to get creative with the problem solving and critical thinking skills. Sorry if I'm going a little fast here. I know this is probably review for a lot of people, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but yeah, anyway, researchers often have to get creative with their uh, problem solving and critical thinking. This is my favorite part of the job is that every time I am reverse engineering a system, it's something new. Uh, I go into work and I never get to do the, never have to do the same thing over and over again um, because I always have to apply new uh, creative thinking uh, skills and problems uh, to whatever I'm working on. Um, it's really awesome to work on problems all day like that. Um, so one of the most common tools we use is this assembler. Um, uh, so you've compiled your code down to your program. What happens then? Um, how does your computer know what kind of file it is? Uh, there's a lot of metadata uh, associated with each file. So when you compile something in, you know, in Linux, you're left with an elf executable. That elf has um, some magic data at the beginning that says it's an elf. Uh, it also has some information saying where the entry point is, where, where the computer uh, should go to start executing. Um, it has things like a symbol table where it has all the function names. Um, processors don't understand um, C code, so when you type something in C, the processor is not going to take that C code and uh, be able to execute it. Um, so that's why we have something that compiles it down to machine code. That's something that the processor does understand. That's the ones and zeros that actually get executed. Um, so when you compile something, you take C code, translate it down to assembly language, which is then translated to machine code, uh, which is then used to create that executable that you run on your system. Uh, reversing is just going backwards from this, right? You take that executable, executable you uh, pull out the machine code from it, you translate that to assembly, and then you can take that assembly and translate that to pseudo code. Pseudo, pseudo code. Um, especially with the release of Deja recently, everyone has access to a free uh, decompiler with they, which they can use to translate machine code into C-like uh, code that you can then read through a lot more easily than um, the ones and zeros or the, the hex view. Uh, in the past, uh, this is the kind of thing that we would look at most, most of our days as reverse engineers. This is a control flow graph. Um, this is uh, uh, the machine code raised to assembly and then broken out into what we call a control flow graph. So you can see the, the function starts at the top here, executes some instructions, um, does an if statement, makes some kind of decision there, goes left to right based on what, what it does. There's a comparison uh, a value with one there. Um, and just a couple of seconds of looking at this thing, you get a pretty good idea of what this function is doing. Um, now you can raise this even further and have a look at, look at it directly as uh, C-like code in Ghidra, uh, which is awesome. You guys should play around with that if you haven't. Um, 
But this is what we look at most of our days, or what we used to, um, while we're reverse engineering. All right, so vulnerabilities. Uh, reverse engineering is typically employed to find vulnerabilities in software or hardware. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people pretend like they, they do reverse engineering to learn how a system works, but really most of us are, are looking to see how we can break a system, um, how we can get it to do something it's not supposed to do. The ultimate goal, of course, does depend on the target. There's a lot of different things you can do to a system. You can um, uh, crash it, you can cause a dial of service that way, you can get around privilege checks or logins um, to get access to data you're not supposed to. Um, you can leak sensitive information, uh, session keys or, or login credentials that way. You can also gain uh, something called remote code execution, which is the ability to run arbitrary code on a target system. So um, uh, what that is is basically I have uh, you know my uh, crypto miner that I don't want to pay the electricity to do, so I hack um, one of your guys' computers and install a crypto miner on your computer, so all of a sudden you're paying for the electricity, uh, and I don't have to. A lot more profitable that way. Um, so uh, these are the basic types of vulnerabilities. Um, I'm going to go over um, how uh, one of these is, is executed in the wild. So uh, one of the most common and easy to understand uh, vulnerabilities is command injection. Uh, vulnerability. So this is, uh, occurs when user input is used in a call to system without proper sanitization. So what does that what does that really mean? Um, many embedded systems um, like routers are really just Linux computers that are uh, purpose built for a specific thing. Um, so your your router is probably a Linux computer running just uh, designed to forward and receive IP traffic. Um, so because you have the full Linux operating system uh, at your disposal when you design an embedded system, you're not going to recreate the wheel. Um, so oftentimes, system calls are used to execute things directly on the command line that there are already utilities to handle um, built into Linux. So for instance, uh, a router manufacturer does not want to recreate the ping utility. right? They just want to use the ping utility that's already baked into Linux. Um, so when you try to ping something from your router, all it's going to do is take the IP address that you have uh, wrap it up into a string and send that string to the command line to execute. Um, and when that happens, um, uh, when those things are executed, executed in the command line through a system, um, they uh, retain the same permissions that the calling binary has. On these embedded systems, most of the time there's only one account and that uh, one user, and that user is root. Um, so you have root permissions if you're able to get that to do what you want it to do instead of what it's trying to do. Uh, also, uh, Bash um, has some really special characters that are uh, key to enabling command injection. So, does anyone know what any of these do? The semicolon, backtick, uh, dollar sign, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. So, those are all ways to chain together commands on the Linux command line, right? So, if you have a command that you have uh, on Linux, and uh, inside of that command you have a second command surrounded by backticks, uh, the, the one in backticks will be executed first, and then the one outside of that will be um, executed afterwards. So this is a really easy way to chain together um, commands. Um, that'll be important later. So a uh, quick example of this. So this is a uh, D-Link router. This is actually a $300 router. Um, so it's not a cheap one. It's not uh, one that you would expect to be full of holes. Um, this example is taken from a, a really awesome blog, um, by the way. Um, one of the things that it has on it is it accepts uh, SOAP requests to perform uh, some actions on the system. So um, it, uh, one of the things that it can do is actually do a ping through the command line. You can send it a HTTP request and say, I want to ping this uh, IP address. And we'll take that IP address and throw it on the command line and do that ping. Um, so it's a $300 thing, right? Surely it checks authorization before executing, right? So let's have a look at that. Um, we can um, find the uh, firmware for this device online, pull, uh, rip it apart, uh, pull out the binaries that are uh, on the um, on the system, load these into IDA. So this is uh, uh, where it's actually doing that um, uh, sending to the to the command line uh, uh, operation. Uh, we see this call to system right here. Uh, it's using a command that is built uh, higher up here using this string, uh, sh percent percent s percent s. Um, .sh. So it's it's building a command to run on the command line, um, and it actually takes something uh, a parameter that is passed in that we can control. Um, now figuring out that we can control that was a little bit more uh, in depth, but I'm going to gloss over that. Basically, we have control over that soap action um, variable there, uh, and it's built into this command that is then passed to the system. Further up above, um, there is actually a check for authorization, uh, but 
right before that check, there is another check to see if uh, this string, um, H, uh, HTTP peer networks.com, HNAP1, get device, if that, if that string um, is in the request, it actually skips the authorization check, um, which is kind of alarming. Uh, so if we pull this out into C pseudocode, um, this is what it actually is doing. So it, it get, grabs that SOAP action from the um, HTTP request that it sent. Um, it checks to see if that uh, string is in uh, the request. If it is, or if it is not, it does an authorization check. If it is, it skips that authorization check, comes down here to the SOAP action, pulls that SOAP action out of the HTTP request, um, builds the um, uh, command down here at the, with that string, and then executes that command on the command line. Uh, so what this means, because there's no sanitization in this, um, is this command from uh, Linux terminal, uh, wget with the header um, with that, that special URL, backtick telnet b backtick. Um, if we send that to the uh, uh, router, it'll actually execute that telnet b, which spawns a telnet daemon. Um, the telnet daemon on this device does not require a login, so you can just telnet right in and are dropped right onto a command line, a, a root uh, owned command line on the terminal, which then you can then use to execute whatever you want on the system. Um, so this is a really, really stupid, easy bug. Um, but it was present in a $300 router, and uh, it was found with less than, a, less than an hour worth of actual work. Um, so these, these kind of bugs are really prevalent in today's society. Um, that was a pretty easy vulnerability to um, make use of. All you had to do was put a command in those backticks and, and you, you owned it. Uh, there are other types of vulnerabilities. Uh, memory corruption, um, you guys have probably heard buffer overflows, heap overflows, those are those kinds of things. Basically corrupting memory um, that you're not supposed to have access to, that can be used to gain control as well. Um, no sanitization of user input, we saw that, what happened uh, with that in the last example. Poor coding practice or poor understanding of security. Um, we actually encountered a thing um, last year with a uh, um, Western Digital uh, NAS device uh, where they thought that they were doing the sanitization, but they were actually using the wrong uh, function to uh, filter out uh, meta, meta characters. So they were checking for meta characters, but not filtering them out, um, which was a really stupid <laughs> stupid mistake to make. So um, they actually pointed us directly at where we should uh, inject our, our commands, which was hilarious. Um, <laughs> uh, backdoors are also built into open source code um, or vendor provided software. So if you buy software from somebody else, um, you're not gonna be able to audit everything that goes into your system. Uh, every open source library you include in your, in your uh, project as well um, has potential to have vulnerabilities in it. Um, uh, another, uh, I was talking about interview questions earlier, another interview question that I often ask people is I, I bring a snippet of open source code that was in, in the uh, ecosystem for 14 years that has several clear vulnerabilities in it uh, that were not patched until 2014. Um, and I, I try to have people pick out the vulnerabilities. Um, so even, uh, you know, people say open sourcing is the best defense. That's not always the case because it actually does require a lot of work to find these vulnerabilities. And if people aren't looking, no one's going to find them. Um, so uh, we also have the possibility of counterfeit hardware and integrated circuits. We, we talked about that earlier. Um, and that's something that um, you can't really audit um, too much yourself. Uh, uh, you can't um, get the specs for the, the motherboard that you're putting in your, in your system um, down to the integrated circuit level. Um, that's something that's really hard to actually audit. Um, so how do we actually defend systems? How do we do this? Um, so proper coding techniques and best practices can go a long way from uh, in eliminating vulnerabilities. If you guys just, you know, just use um, things like Valgrind to check your project for memory uh, leaks or um, many open source tools that scan your thing for vulnerable codes, uh, code um, practices. Um, also, there's a lot of things like in C, you can use uh, string and print um, to build a string instead of stir print. Uh, the n uh, takes in an extra uh, variable um, that is the length that you're supposed to be copying that prevents you from being exposed to buffer overflows. Um, I don't know why that isn't common practice. It really should be, um, and it's stupid simple. It's actually just one extra character in the, in the function name. I don't know why people don't do it, but nobody does. Um, but even with all those practices, that still won't save your system from vulnerable open source libraries that you bring in, or hardware bugs. Um, also, uh, the key about security is it's not about um, having 100, or, uh, an attacker does not need to have access to 100% of the system. They just need to have one mistake. Uh, and that is a lot easier to look for than to make sure that your code is 100% secure. It's a lot easier to find that one mistake that somebody made. 
on the attacker shop is always easier there. Um, obfuscation is another option. Uh, you can attempt to throw a reverse engineer off the trail. So you can make it harder for researchers to do research. Um, and what this looks like is we can take a control flow graph um, like this. And uh, interesting note is that a couple years ago, there was some guys out of, out of Cambridge that discovered that the x86 move instruction was Turing complete. Um, so any program written in any language can be translated just a series of move instructions. Um, so we wrote a compiler to do that um, at Patel. Uh, you can find that on GitHub. Um, when you do that to a program, that's what the control flow graph looks like. Um, so uh, that is a lot harder to reverse engineer. You can't pull out any meaning from that at all. So with this, with this kind of view, you can see, hey, there's some decision making. Hey, it's doing a loop here. All right, we've got something to work with there. Here, no idea what the fuck's going on. Um, right? But when we did this, um, that was a lot of fun. And we realized that messing with what people are seeing is actually an interesting way to, to proceed research-wise. Um, which led to another thing. Uh, what if we mess with the psychology of somebody uh, while we're doing this stuff? Um, so we developed a, another tool called RE Psych. We were actually able to build uh, images in control flow graphs in our programs. So if you compile your code with RE Psych, you can actually build messages into the control flow graph. Um, and uh, uh, if you're reverse engineering something and are presented with that, I would just give up immediately. I would not even bother. Um, so that is. Um, this, this, uh, these tools were, uh, were talked about, at, uh, we presented at DEF CON a couple of years ago. Um, Chris Domas, the guy that presented it, also um, got his RE Psych tool to um, actually, uh, when you run the program, it finds an image on your, uh, the, the system that's running it and then builds a uh, picture inside of itself uh, with that image. So you can actually take a picture of yourself and then you can see that in um, the control flow graph that you're looking at. It's really creepy, and I recommend checking it out. Um, that was kind of weird. Um, so long story short, we found that a good defense only gets you so far. Really, uh, What a really good defense is is a really good offense. If you can find the vulnerabilities before an attacker can, you'll be in a lot better shape. Um, so if you assume your system is vulnerable, um, uh, now you can go on and figure out how to find those vulnerabilities before your attacker gets a chance to do it. Um, but how? How do we do that? So trained cyber engineers are extremely scarce. There's only a few thousand people in the United States that are actually uh, trained to competent reverse engineering people. Um, so hiring more is not really an option. We can't, we can't just go out and say, I want, I want five more reverse engineers. They just don't exist. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, stuff at, um, uh, a lot of companies around the, around the country are doing a lot to uh, help train more people. We bring in people, specifically like at Patel, we've got uh, something called Cyber Academy where we take uh, people that are um, uh, have the fundamentals but don't really have the, the uh, act, uh, practice uh, doing the actual skills. We have a, like a basically a master's equivalent program that we put people through uh, on, on company time to train them. Uh, but that's really not enough. Really, uh, this needs to be addressed at a, at a um, you know um, uh, countrywide level to, to really meet the demand for all these uh, security uh, positions. Um, on top of that, there are potentially millions of adversaries out there trying to be a sponge. So right now in China, there's probably a room very similar to this, but uh, triple the size uh, of people learning how to do reverse engineering. Um, so if any one of you guys can do the work of four Chinese people, um, please apply to Patel. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, that's, uh, again, not very likely. Um, so automation is going to be the key here. So we're going to need to find ways to um, automate the, the work that we do in order to stay ahead of the game. We're going to need to do that in order to, to be relevant. Um, but there's a catch here. Um, vulnerability research is really often thought more of it as an art than a science. So um, how do we translate some stuff that's like a, a gut feeling or, or intuition that a, reverse, a trained reverse engineer has, how do we translate that into science? Uh, and that's not something that we really have a lot of uh, experience doing in the United States. Um, we've got a lot of really bright people, but um, it's um, like I said, I used to work with Chris Domas, and if you sat down with Chris Domas, you could only understand every, every other word that he said, right? So um, how do you take some, some information or some uh, uh, knowledge that people like that have and translate it into something that's more accessible to the majority of people? Um, so the first step is really defining how we find vulnerabilities. How do, we, how do we do this to begin with? So the easiest way to find bugs and crashes uh, in programs is through fuzzing. Um, fuzzing, uh, for those that don't know, here's a definition, is an automated method of discovering faults in software by providing unexpected input and monitoring for exceptions. So 
what does that really mean? Um, simplest form is you just cat dev you random in, into your binary and just see what happens. Provide it random input over and over and over again. Just throw random bits and bytes at it um, to see what happens. This is a really great way of shaking out really stupid bugs. Um, but it won't get you very far. If you're trying to fuzz a protocol like um, no, no, anything really, um, you, you really need to be more complex if you're going to get uh, too far into, into this um, uh, uh, work. Um, so uh, another, another way of fuzzing things is to capture some actually expected input and then modify that. So randomly, randomly mutate the bits and bytes that the uh, program is expecting uh, to, to generate unexpected input. Um, it's going to only get you so far again, so a slightly more complex way of fuzzing is to model the data that is being passed, parsed by the application. Um, this today takes a little bit more of a uh, reverse engineering effort, but um, if you can actually build a fuzzer that models uh, an HTTP request, that builds out those headers and builds out those, those parameters that are passed into it, you can fuzz the things that are actually important, like the data that goes into the parameters, instead of trying to figure out how to get the, the structure um, randomly. Um, so, You'll get a lot more throughput with something like this, but it does take some more upfront effort to get set up. And really, lastly, the, the really smart thing that people are doing now uh, with fuzzing is an evolutionary um, fuzzing uh, uh, algorithm. Um, people instrument code. Um, they add uh, hooks and, and uh, ways to check on the progress of the, of the, of the code. Uh, and then they generate new inputs based off of code coverage. So what does that mean is that they, they monitor how far a given input gets into a program and then take the ones that get really far and then modify those to see if they can get farther or get different code paths. Um, and uh, one of the best tools for doing that is AFL. Uh, it's actually American Fuzzy Lop, uh, named after a rabbit because of how fast it mutates. Um, easily one of the best uh, fuzzing frameworks in existence. This actually uses genetic algorithms. So they actually uh, take a, a page out of biology to generate their new input um, to uh, efficiently increase code coverage. So they take that input that gets as far as they can into the binary and then apply genetic mutations to that input to get further into the code. Um, it has been proven to find a lot of uh, really awesome bugs in real code, Firefox, Internet Explorer, iOS kernel, etc. cetera. Um, uh, for really efficient use, you can actually take your, your own source code and compile it with a special utility that instruments the binary for you, so get even more throughput on, on your, your fuzzing. Um, it's amazingly fast for less complex binaries. Um, but what if the interface you're trying to uh, fuzz is much, much slower? This works really well if you have a binary that you're trying to fuzz. Um, but what if you're trying to fuzz something like a radio? Um, that is something that takes a lot harder, or a lot more work to set up. Um, first of all, you're going to have to figure out how to send it data. Um, and that is going to be probably, if it's you know, a radio or Wi-Fi thing, you're going to have to uh, create your, or put your data into Wi-Fi packets to send it across the, the, the waves to the device. Um, that's going to take some time to develop that protocol-specific data model. Uh, you're also going to need some way of monitoring the system to see if you crash it. So you have to find some way to, uh, to uh, attach a debugger to this thing to watch for uh, crashes. And, and how do you determine what crashed? Um, there may be several different processes running on there. If one of them uh, crashes, you might um, not be able to send it more data, but it might not do anything interesting. Um, you also need to have some way of delivering the data, so you might actually need hardware. You actually might need to build hardware to send data to these devices. Um, so setting up a fuzzer for something like this could take anywhere from a week to several months. Um, and the uh, number of executions you get uh, is very low, right? So if you're anything, if anytime you're doing with setting up channels and, and sending data across those channels, it's going to take a lot of overhead to send that. So you're not going to get very much throughput. So here we have a tool, uh, enter a tool called Unicorn. Unicorn is a really awesome, scriptable, lightweight emulator. Uh, it supports a bunch of popular architectures. So what Unicorn can do is emulate code. Um, and so you don't need physical hardware to run code on after that. Um, so this provides us a bunch of new capabilities. So we can no longer, we no longer have to rely on using physical hardware to um, uh, do our uh, research. Uh, we can rip firmware off of a chip, uh, emulate only the bits and pieces that we care about, um, and then um, spread that out uh, across many different uh, unique nodes. You don't have to have you know, 10 different um, uh, unique devices. We can have 1,000 different cores on a uh, system like you guys have down in the lab. Um, that can massively parallelize our research and, and speed up our process a lot. Um, firmware can be acquired physically uh, or extracted from updates on, found online. Um, uh, something you guys uh, might not know is that 
a lot of embedded systems just have their uh, firmware updates available online. You can go and grab it. Um, we want to get pizza. Let's uh, get to a spot where you feel comfortable right yeah. We can we can stop right here. Sure. Fine. Yeah. Cool. You guys want pizza real quick? Yeah. I know it's a lot easier to pay attention when you have pizza. So. <laughs> So Unicorn, though, I've um, never heard of that. That's crazy. Oh, Unicorn. Yeah. So is it? It's basically like you know platform IO. Yeah. It's basically like the same thing, but except for more like processor architecture. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on it as well, but um, okay. Yeah, it is. It is awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're actually using platform IO for our Series Nine project. We're making like our own industrial embedded system. So um, just to test the firmware and stuff like that. So that's really cool that you can actually do that for like a processor. The, the you, so this know. software you just showed us, Unicorn, is literally platform I/O, but except you can run like, on yeah. different x86 different types of processors. Let's <laughs> <laughs> test your firmware. What are we doing this summer? <laughs> so there was actually a very interesting um, article published in the most recent uh, POC or TFO. I don't know if you guys know that. Yep. Did you guys read the, the ARM? ARM Master. I have read the so we have a POC able to work with the Bible. Yeah. yeah. So the, the most recent this year has an article in it that was about ARM. Um, and uh, ARM actually, a lot of the instructions in ARM have optional grids. I got my flash one. a lot of instructions. Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, so, uh, what this guy found was that if you flip those optional grids that are not used in some instructions, the program continues to execute because the processor doesn't care about those bits. Um, but every disassembler breaks after that. Um, so, all of a sudden, they're invalid instructions, but it still is. And that's another reason why ARM is probably going to be used more and more in the future. Risk Risk V is uh, supposed to be the next big thing. Yeah, I've read a book about that, not so much. Yeah, nobody's really adopted it yet, but as soon as somebody does, it's gonna be it's gonna be big. Right. Well, you know, so Microsoft will adopt that in about twenty five years. Yeah. Yeah. So I have like a similar instruction set, like what's like what are the um, some, like, the differences yeah. between that? So it's like, supposed to be um, it's got a, like a bunch of built in features that like make yeah. <laughs> uh, security problems non existent. Um, oh. so um, like they 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 bake in things like stack canaries and, and things of that nature um, so that you don't have to have rely on a programmer to do it. What is this? No. It's kind of risk risk going. going. Risk is like RA. Yeah. Like, oh. yeah. yeah. Stands for risk four. Five. 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 This is uh, uh, RT. RT. Trace RT. RT. <laughs> hey, do you want to do any pizza? Oh no, I'm gonna skip it. I actually had a, had like pizza every night of the week for the last week. <laughs> I, have to, I have to stop at some point. <laughs> yeah, I've had pizza for the last three days. <laughs> I'm not in college anymore. I can't live up with that. Pizza every night's a powerful Um. All right. So anyway, like I said. Um, Unicorn is a really awesome tool that opens up a lot more uh, possibilities for us. It allows us to uh, only emulate the, the, um, the parts of the uh, binary that we care about. Um, so uh, uh, we uh, combined both AFL and Unicorn together to create another tool called AFL Unicorn. Um, so again, available on GitHub. So what um, AFL Unicorn does is it takes all the best things out of Unicorn and all the best things out of AFL and puts them together. So we take code um, that is hard to reach by a traditional fuzzer, um, emulate just that code, and then use AFL to generate input directly into that function. Um, so the way what, what that uh, ends up meaning is that we can fuzz um, at the function level instead of having to go through all that, all that setup and tear down every time we want to send a packet to, to an embedded system. Um, we can just start executing the, the, um, the function at the top and say, here's the data that uh, was passed into you, and go. Um, which massively speeds up the, the process here. So what we need to do in order to use AFL Unicorn, we need to create a starting point. Um, so in order to do that, we need a, a memory snapshot of the system uh, as it's about to process a frame. Um, so we can attach a debugger to a system like the radio, um, send it uh, one test frame uh, 
hit a breakpoint right as we're about to parse that frame, capture the uh, memory snapshot at that point, uh, and then we have a complete memory snapshot and CPU state of when it's about to process that, um, that frame. We can then take that, that frame um, uh, and then replay that over and over and over again through Unicorn uh, to just start execution right at that beginning of that, provide mutated uh, input directly to the function at that um, right there, uh, and then continue execution to see if anything crashes. Um, so then that frees us up to do a lot of things. We can write a unicorn script in anything that has um, unicorn bindings. So they actually bindings for Python, C, Go, basically every language. Um, you just need to create that save memory state, and then you can use AFL to generate your input for you, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so this takes as little as an hour to set up um, and can get you massively more executions. And this is something that can scale as well. So you can take um, a fuzzer. Uh, and distribute it over a um, cloud computing system and uh, parallelize all your research very quickly. Um, so uh, AFL Unicorn is able to fuzz anything that Unicorn Engine can't emulate. So we don't require source code. It eliminates many of AFL's limitations. Um, it only fuzzes the code you care about, um, and it can lead to vulnerability discovery. And um, uh, interestingly enough, last month, or actually it was in January, uh, there was an article posted uh, where some guys actually used AFL Unicorn to find an actual vulnerability in uh, Marvel's uh, Wi-Fi system on chips. Um, so these uh, Wi-Fi system on chips are used in a lot of gaming consoles. Um, the one that they demonstrated the proof of concept on was actually the Steam Link. Um, they found a vulnerability in the um, uh, mechanism for scanning for Wi-Fi networks that this chip does. So every five minutes the chip scans for available Wi-Fi networks. Whether or not it's already on a network, it does it anyway. Um, so traditionally, this would be very hard to fuzz. You get one execution per five minutes, which is absolutely horrendous. Um, but using AFL Unicorn, they were able to, to inject these, these uh, Wi-Fi packets directly into the interface, into the function that's parsing it, and discover this vulnerability. Uh, and then they actually weaponized it. Um, this is a really cool article. They actually go from um, zero knowledge, let's say zero knowledge, to zero click uh, RCE. Um, so uh, if you guys are interested in, in seeing how this, this kind of research is performed in the real world, this is a really great article to learn from that. Um, so uh, what now? So we all have this awesome new tool for finding vulnerabilities. Um, but having to repeat this for every single new target requires the same setup we just went through. Even if it's not that difficult, but if you scale this over thousands and thousands of embedded systems, that's going to be a pain in the ass. Um, so, and uh, even if the same exact bug is present, you're going to have to do that same process to verify it. Um, so uh, we need to come up with a new way to fingerprint a vulnerability and look for that vulnerability in a piece of code uh, directly. Um, and uh, to do this, uh, we're going to use a couple tools, Binary Ninja and Graken. So Binary Ninja is a uh, uh, disassembler like um, Ida and Ghidra. Um, the, the benefit that Binary Ninja had, um, or I guess still has, but it's not really as drastic now that heaters out. Binary Ninja um, has a bunch of intermediate languages that you can lift the, the um, uh, program to, um, to more easily reason about data. And I'll get more into what an intermediate language is in just a minute. Uh, and then Graken is used as to build knowledge graphs and hyper-relational databases. Uh, it has its own query language to, to efficiently search through uh, knowledge graphs. Um, so let's talk about more about that, that uh, intermediate languages. So in assembly, um, we have a function here that has um, four basic blocks, 14 instructions. You can see it on the side here. Um, we can lift that, using binary Ninja, we can lift that into uh, something called a medium level intermediate language, um, which uh, abstracts a lot of the information away and uh, gives you a lot more data. So this has um, flags, it has types, it has stack usage, and it, resol uh, it resolves stack usage. Um, so you can actually see, um, you know, it has uh, if zero equals zero, it has uh, variables in there. Um, it's got a lot less uh, basic blocks, a lot, a lot, many fewer instructions. Um, so this is a lot easier to understand. It's, it's getting closer and closer to that C-like syntax. Um, so this is a, a really useful tool for reasoning about data. Um, uh, now I'm going to define something completely off the wall here and, and talk about an ontology. Um, which is definitely not the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being. Uh, we're going to go with the second one here, which is the set of concepts and categories in a subject area or domain that shows their properties and the relations between them. So what does that uh, actually mean? So an ontology is, allows us to define connections between data, concepts, or things. Um, so uh, a resource, entity, role, relation, rules. So here we have um, 
uh, a wife is a role. Um, a person can play the role, role of wife. Um, a wife. A person is an entity. A person has a name. That name is a resource. So we can build these relations between um, things. So ontology uh, rule is a concept that allows uh, inferences to be made on data. So here we have a bunch of rules that sheep can only eat grass, and vegetarians can only eat things that are not animals, and if grass is not an animal, uh, then the inference can be then sheep are not vegetarians. Um, so we can build rules that we can then use inferences, uh, that then define inferences. Um, so visualizing this kind of stuff, um, we actually can take um, uh, the data that was uh, in the basic blocks in the functions before and assign it rules and um, uh, what, do we, what do we call it? Um, connections and uh, uh, entities and relationships uh, between the data in that. Uh, in that uh, uh, whatever the function here, um, so we can cr uh, apply those same uh, rules and relations to this this uh, um, function, and when we do that, we can visualize something like this. So we have a function. That function has many basic blocks underneath it. Each basic block has many instructions, and each instruction has operate uh, operands, which then have values. Uh, so we can build out this uh, uh, graph uh, database or this relational database here um, using these relationships and these rules. A little bit more visualization here. If we did see that basic block, um, that basic block contains instructions, and that instruction contains operands, and that operand contains, or that um, that instruction uh, is an op, whatever I don't know what I'm uh, trying to say there. Uh, but then there's constants there as well. Uh, so we can see how these uh, rules and, and relationships relationships can be applied to um, code. Um, then uh, Graken allows us to write some um, queries uh, to build. Um, rules for identifying things. We can do say, like, hey, I want everything that looks like a function, and it will return you everything that looks like a function. So um, again, we uh, combine these two tools into something called paper machete. Um, so we use Binary Ninja to lift a binary into an intermediate language, um, extract some semantic meaning behind those functions, um, then uh, load this data into a hyper-relational database in Graken. Um, and create a Grackle queries that match vulnerabilities. So this is us creating a fingerprint for vulnerability. So if we find a vulnerability, we can then say, all right, anything that has these characteristics um, might also have this vulnerability. So we can create a Grackle query that matches everything with those relationships um, to then search for these patterns in new things um, without having to actually um, you know, verify it by hand or anything like that or look at it yourself. Um, so here, another example of the workflow. Uh, we take a binary, load it in a binary ninja, um, that uh, pulls out that machine code, lets you reason that, we lift that into an intermediate language, uh, pull out those semantic meanings or sort of semantic relationships between the data, load that into a hyper-relational database, build Gracken, um, Grackle queries that match those, those relationships, and then we get our free zero days, um, which is awesome. Um, now, the problem here is that um, uh, data, this is a common data science problem, and, and we see it in, in um, computer science as well, is that there's, uh, data is really easy to create and really difficult to curate. So it's really hard to, to um, have a ground truth for vulnerabilities that are out there. Nobody is there creating a database of, of vulnerabilities, or are they? Um, so uh, Trail of Bits is a company out in uh, New York, a really awesome company. We do a lot of work with them uh, on um, some projects. Um, but they uh, have created a, um, uh, an, an effort uh, they're using to help standardize uh, benchmarking tools. Um, so uh, what they do is, uh, or I guess let me, let me take a step back here. And um, I, in 2016, DARPA sponsored the CyberGrand Challenge, which is a really awesome competition. Um, uh, it was a, um, a CTF, but it had a bit of a twist. Uh, the CTF um, was entirely automated. So they had contestants build intelligent agents that would be able to find, um, weaponize, uh, and execute vulnerabilities in code. Um, they did, DARPA is really uh, known for doing this kind of stuff. They, they really are uh, trying to push the boundaries of science, and they, they um, try to do a lot of stuff that might not even be possible to see what might fall out of it. Uh, Cyber Grand Challenge is one of those things. Um, and so what happened was um, uh, Cyber Grand Challenge created a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of these vulnerabilities, and then defined exactly what each vulnerability was. Um, and then uh, Trail of Bits 
took those vulnerabilities that Cyber Grand Challenge made public uh, and translated them into um, more easily accessible uh, architectures like x86. Um, so now we have a data set that we can work with. We have a full uh, database of well-structured and um, um, annotated vulnerabilities that we can use to train on. Um, so thanks, DARPA. Um, so here's Paper Machete. So um, what Paper Machete allows us to do, like I said, we can write Grackle queries that match on vulnerabilities. We can then um, take a new binary, load it into Paper Machete. It, it does all the pre-processing, runs our scripts that match those vulnerabilities, and then it tells us, hey, look, we found a array index missing bounds check um, vulnerability in this binary, which is a buffer overflow vulnerability. Uh, and now we have a nice data set to check it on as well. Um, so this is actually an example of us uh, using Paper Machete to find a vulnerability in one of the Cyber Grand Challenge um, uh, projects or uh, vulnerabilities. Really cool project. Um, so now I'm going to take another step and, and look at something completely different and talk about trust here. Um, so uh, one thing that we do is we do not trust software. Um, we audit it, reverse, we break it. I hope that is pretty evident to you guys at this point. Um, there's a lot of people that are doing this stuff, the software. But we often trust the hardware running on without a second thought. So all these tools are great, but they don't really um, help uh, audit the, the processor or the, the integrated circuits that you're running on. Um, but hardware can have the same bugs as software. I mean, a lot of you guys are electrical engineering students, right? You make the same mistakes that programmers do when you're designing um, electro, or electrical systems. Um, these can be programming issues. They can be uh, hidden functionality that's baked in that you don't know about. They can also be counterfeit chips. Um, you, you might buy a chip and, and somebody might have written the name on, of the chip on the top, but it might not be what, you're, what you actually bought. Um, so more on the, the hidden functionality part. Um, this is a page taken out of um, the opcode, um, basically, dictionary for x86. This is supposed to be the entire entirety of all valid x86 instructions. Um, so what's that? <laughs> why, why are there blank spaces here? Why is there a possibility that there's not something defined? Um, and oftentimes, um, this happens because uh, developers for um, architectures um, like to have their own debug tools, right? They like to have their ability to do um, uh, uh, auditing of their own code. But they don't want to expose that to people. So sometimes they'll just delete the entry in the, in the, in the dictionary before they're publishing it to people um, and just say, who knows what's there? We don't. Um, but how, how do we find out about that? How do we, how do we you know, figure out what is, what is there? Um, so our goal now, how can we build something uh, that will help us audit hardware? How can we find these hidden instructions or functionality? Um, so consider x86, instructions could be one byte or 15 bytes. Um, and that's a huge number of possibilities. If you try to blindly fuzz the number of possibilities, that's hilariously ineffective. Um, you, it, there's like more possibilities for x86 instructions than there are atoms in the universe. Um, so um, uh, we are also assuming that we can't trust the documentation, right? Um, so if we can't trust the documentation, how do we, how do, what, what do we use to, to guide us? Um, and even if we found something, how could we tell that we found something? Uh, how would we even be able to tell if we found an instruction? We don't know what it's supposed to do. We don't know if it's going to crash. We don't know if it's going to do uh, an un unbound read somewhere or anything like that. Um, so uh, we had an observation. Uh, in x86, the meaningful bytes in an instruction either impact the length of the instruction or its expected behavior. Um, that's really key. And that, that helps us build on um, another thing called uh, we call tunneling. Um, which, if you guys have taken your algorithms class, is just a depth first search uh, uh, algorithm that we use to quickly skip over instructions that we don't find interesting. Remember, we, we, we are only interested in the ones that impact the length of the instruction or its effective behavior. Um, this lets us find the interesting instructions quickly. And it reduces the searchable space that we have to a much more reasonable size, uh, down to like 100 million uh, possibilities for x86, which can be done in about one day. Um, so what, how does tunneling work? So we take. Uh, uh, some data, so, so we start with zero and we start executing and we, no, we note uh, how many bytes the processor tries to um, grab because when it, the processor reads that first zero, it's going to say, okay, I know what zero means, um, but in order to execute that, that thing, I need another, another byte. So it grabs another byte. Um, so we know, oh, it's grabbing two zeros. It's grabbing them and then we increment that, that last bit, uh, or last byte by one. And we say, okay, that zero, it's still, it's still trying to grab that second uh, byte there. It's still only grabbing that second byte and executing. 
And we can work our way through this until we get to an instruction, we get that four, and all of a sudden the processor tries to grab another byte. Um, so that byte then uh, is meaningful. That byte impacts the length of the instruction. Um, so uh, we can do this uh, same process, keep going down. You know, we can start incrementing the lowest byte now, keep going, keep going, and then all of a sudden we got to a five, and that uh, made the processor fetch even more, more bytes. Um, so the processor knows what these instructions are, right? Uh, but it knows that it needs more uh, bytes in order to execute correctly. So it keeps trying to grab those. So um, uh, this can keep going on and on. Um, so uh, the next thing is, of course, how do we tell when the processor is trying to grab more bytes? Um, that's the next logical thing. How can we actually uh, tell when the, when the processor needs another byte? Um, how do you measure the length of instruction there? So we use something called page fault analysis. So what this does is we take uh, the instruction we want to execute and build two pages in memory, one with read, write, and execute permissions, and one with only read and write permissions. Uh, then we execute the instruction. We put that instruction on that border between the two things. If the processor determines that it needs another byte, it will try to fetch and execute that next byte, leading to a page fault, because it's not allowed to execute on that next page. So um, if it tries to execute that zero, it's going to say, hey, I need another, another byte, so I'm going to try to grab the next byte and execute it. But it's on that next page, and when it tries to execute that 6a, uh, it'll fail. So we can slowly walk our way back uh, until the, the entire um, uh, instruction executes correctly uh, without a, a error. And then we know the exact length of that instruction. Um, so that's a really, really awesome um, step. And we're going to go a little bit further here. Um, so we now know how many bytes the instruction decoder uh, consumed. Uh, but just because the bytes were decoded does not mean that instruction exists. It might, it might be um, you know, uh, useless data. If the instruction does not exist, the processor actually generates a uh, pound UD exception, which is an invalid opcode exception. Um, so if we don't receive that exception, we know that the instruction exists. Um, now, whether it's in the, uh, the documentation or not doesn't matter. We know that it exists. Um, so then we have to find some way of sifting these results. Um, so uh, how, do we, how do we make sense of these instructions? We know we have a list of instructions that we know exist and a list of instructions that, we, that the processor says don't exist. Um, we need some way of pulling out anomalies from some ground truth. So in order to do this, we actually use a tool called Capstone, um, which is a disassembler um, used in a lot of really popular tools. Um, uh, so the um, Capstone was written based on the documentation. So they trusted the documentation. Um, uh, so we're going to say, um, then if we uh, find something uh, that the processor says exists, let me see if I have this. Um, so the dis, uh, if, if we have an instruction uh, that the disassembler doesn't recognize the byte sequence of, so that as far as the documentation is concerned, the, the, pro, the instruction doesn't exist, but it does not generate a pound UD, um, then we know um, that the instruction um, is undocumented and um, is a, doing something. Um, so uh, for software bugs, um, a, di a, di a disassembler can often recognize the instruction, but the processor says the length is different. Um, so uh, this is actually, uh, actually manifested as you know, a, a programmer for Intel might have made a mistake when implementing a certain esoteric uh, instruction that does not actually conform to their stated documentation. So it could be a mistake. Right? It could be just a software bug. Um, it could also be a hardware bug. And how do we determine that? Um, we don't really have a, a consistent heuristic for doing this. Basically, we run until something breaks, and then we investigate. Um, uh, it works. Uh, but yeah, if you guys can think of another one, again, apply to Patel. Mm -hmm. um, so here's, here, here's an uh, inaction, uh, sifting through results. So researchers now have a way to audit the process, the code, or the process that the code is running on. Um, we actually found a lot of undocumented instructions. Most of these had been discovered independently before SanSister. Um, which is the tool that we're, we uh, built here. Um, we actually uh, found a in one particular x86 chip um, that there was a hardware backdoor baked into it. That uh, there was an instruction that was undocumented that allowed um, you to read and write kernel memory from user land. Um, so without kernel permissions, you were able to read and write memory in the kernel using this undocumented instruction. Um, so you can just write, a, write up a C, uh, C code that uh, executes that uh, undocumented instruction and do whatever you want to kernel memory. Um, that was found in an actual x86 chip. Um, 
that um, is in the wild today. It was actually uh, um, used in a lot of industrial control systems, uh, embedded systems like that. Um, but really cool results. If you want to hear more about Sand Sifter, we also did a talk on uh, Sand Sifter um, two years ago, and then uh, Chris Domos went back to DEF CON last year to talk about the, the back door that we found. Um, so in summary, um, cybersecurity is critically important to individuals, corporations, and national security. I hope you guys are, are realizing that at this point. Um, also, automation is key to staying ahead of adversaries. We're going to need to do it in order to stay ahead. Um, but autom automation alone won't solve everything. We need smart automation. Um, we can uh, you know, spin up as many blind fuzzing instances as we can, but it'll be a lot more effective if we can use uh, effective tools to uh, narrow down our search space like, like AFL Unicorn. Um, also, we don't trust software, and we should stop trusting hardware. Um, that's another thing to, to take away from this. Um, and with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Do you have any questions about anything? Um, basically, every tool that I talked about today, you can find on our GitHub page as well. So if you guys want to play around with that, feel free to. Um, any questions? Yeah. yeah. What do you think the biggest field of cybersecurity in the future opening up is going to be? Like, what is what do you think is the next frontier, so to speak? Um, preventing people from being stupid. Um, <laughs> so. Um, the, the vulnerabilities, a lot of the stuff, the reverse engineering stuff that, that um, I do um, is a result of people just not using the tools available to them. Um, and so if we can build tools that, that more effectively force people to do proper coding uh, standards and actually um, audit code, uh, source code before it's being sent out uh, to these systems, that is probably the most important thing. Um, and that's going to be the biggest field going forward because um, Let's face it, the reverse engineering vulnerability research, this is pretty hard stuff for a lot of people. Um, and it's a lot easier to train people to do better coding than it is to train people to do stuff that, that like this. Um, so for the vast majority of cybersecurity, that's going to be the big frontier in the future, um, not um, stuff that we do. Obviously, the, the attacking is never going to stop. Uh, so we're going need to need to do it somehow. But the biggest field is going to be preventing people from being stupid. Yeah. Um, in your experience, what type of systems typically have the most vulnerabilities? Um, uh, yeah, embedded systems that um, are cheap, first of all. Uh, that should be a given, but um, a lot of times, um, uh, routers specifically, there's a lot of like Linksys and Netgear, um, they have a shit ton of routers. Um, they don't want to do a whole design process every time that they um, want to create a new model. Right. They often reuse a lot of their code, which means that a lot of these embedded systems routers or providers have the same vulnerabilities in every one of their products. Um, so uh, that's the easiest thing, um, or the easiest way to find vulnerabilities is to find something that targets a specific device, look for a model that's slightly similar, and see if it works on it. Um, it usually will, um, which is why we built that fingerprinting tool to, to find those fingerprints like that. Um, the other, the other aspect of it um, is there's a lot of devices that um, were never intended to be on the internet, and so never had security in mind when they were designed. Um, and the biggest one that comes to mind there is cars. Um, we actually do a lot of vehicle research at Patel. Um, and if you get on a car network, there's nothing you can't do. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, some guys with some DARPA funding um, actually uh, uh, used a, a wireless exploit. They went through a... Um, uh, a Bluetooth chip or a, a OnStar chip in a, in a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, once they got code execution through that chip, they were actually able to engage the braking system while a reporter was driving the car on the highway, um, which is not something that should have happened. Um, but it's uh, it's something that happens because the networks on vehicles are inherently unsecure, um, and that's that's a big concern as well. Really, all you have to do is like tap into the CAN bus. In the yep. Car. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a CAN bus is uh, it's a broadcast network. Um, so, which means that if you have code execution on any module on the network, you can talk to any other module. There's no um, isolation of things, really. Just to reduce wires in the system, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, that a fun, fun history to note was that um, car manufacturers, when they were developing uh, cars, they were running wires from each module to each other module that actually added a significant amount of weight to the car. Um, and so they ended up using the broadcast network because it was a lot cheaper and, and less uh, heavy. Because um, every, every module just had to tap into one bus. So. Yeah. 
you do uh, much research on like PLCs and you know, where do you think the field's going for securing our uh, critical infrastructure like that? Um, yeah, so uh, one of the uh, one of the big focuses on our cyber group at Mattel is hardware trust and assurance. Um, it is a really big problem. Um, we actually have a, a something called the uh, Integrated Circuit Exploitation Lab at Patel, where we take integrated circuits and figure out how to break them. They do all kinds of black magic stuff, like shine lasers on chips and read memory off keys and that. I don't know how it works, but um, if we ever have a device that we need to get into, we just send it down to them and they just return a, a firmware dump a couple days later and it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, we're doing a lot of work with the Air Force Research Lab out in Dayton to um, figure out ways to audit software or hardware like that. Um, we actually have a tool called Battelle Barricade um, that uh, sends electrical signals through integrated circuits um, to uh, determine whether or not a chip is counterfeit or not. Um, it, it works really well and we're, we're getting some really cool buy-in from, from the Air Force and we're starting to implement that at uh, the right pad out of Dayton. Um, so um, uh, the, again, the biggest problem there is that we don't um, have a big uh, uh, data selection of known bad chips or known integrated circuits that are counterfeit or known known systems that have um, hardware capabilities baked into them. Um, we kind of have to create those as we go and that, that makes it a really easy to um, self-validate, right? We can we can find the bugs that we know about. We can't we don't know if we can find the ones that we don't know about. Um, which is kind of scary. Any other questions? Do you want to talk about the April 20th? Yeah. Okay. So uh, who all signed up for to come up to Patel? Nice. So um, yeah, uh, April 20th, I'm going to have a bunch of you guys come up. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about um, hacking um, uh, video games. We're actually going to be playing a MMORPG. Um, that was designed specifically to be hacked. Um, uh, really cool game. It actually has a fully featured thing, but the only difference is that the bosses in the game, you actually have to cheat at the game in order to kill them, um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, there's also some PvP that's enabled, so sometimes when we do this, uh, we just say um, whoever has the best, you know, who, who, can, who can kill each other, who, who develops the best hack at the end of the day wins, um, right? Which is a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess that's uh, two, two Saturdays from now. Uh, you guys are going to come up. We're going to um, go over how you go about reverse engineering, something like that, something like a video game. Um, we've got the game server set up so we can jump into the game and, and start exploring around. Um, you guys can um, write your own hacks, um, uh, be creative with what, what you're doing as well. We have a, a pretty cool uh, hooking um, uh, script that we have set up that you can um, hook um, internet or the traffic that's going to and from the server so you can inject your own. Uh, things and analyze the data that's going back and forth. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to have um, a bunch of people, a bunch of my colleagues are going to stop by and, and work with us to do it. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Well, I guess the answer is no, but should we bring our own devices to that? Yeah, you can. So, um, uh, yeah, bring your, bring your own laptop. Um, okay. I will not be providing laptops for all of you. So, <laughs> uh, but the, the game runs on um, uh, everything. So Mac, uh, Mac Linux, uh, Windows. So. Any other questions? Awesome, guys. Thanks for being somewhat attentive. Yeah. <laughs>